Hello, and welcome to the PFF Summit 2021 Grief Writing Workshop. My name is Kate Gates. I am the Vice President of Advocacy and Programs for the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. I appreciate everyone joining us for this session. Our speaker tonight is Penny Hunt. Penny is an inspirational, entertaining, and high content speaker. She is a member of the National Speakers Association, Women's Speakers Association, and the president and founder of Journey Through LLC. Her weekly blog, Writings from the Corner of Spirit and Brave, is read worldwide. She's the author of the book, Love Your Life No Matter What, 76 Tips to Live Life with Love and Gratitude. And her new book, Love Your Life No Matter What, 76 Tips to Journey Through Grief and Loss. She is a columnist for several newspapers, including the Wyoming Tribune Eagle and the South Dakota Rapid City Journal. After a series of life-changing events, including the death of her child, Penny left her career as executive director of a healthcare organization where she spoke locally and nationally on healthcare recruitment. She now writes and speaks about how to change, heal, and empower your life. Penny's personal successes and challenges have shaped her grateful for it all viewpoint. She has married her own life lessons with her gift of communication to follow her passion of helping others journey, journey through this life with spirit, courage, and compassion. Many of us have heard Penny speak before. She always has excellent insights and tips for our personal practices. I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to share today. I will turn it over to Penny now. Well, thank you for having me here today. I am Penny Hunt, and I'm thrilled to be doing this grief writing workshop for the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation Summit once again. Today, we're going to talk about putting our pain on paper and how writing about your grief really helps you process and manage your feelings and emotions. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about me and in this introduction before we get started. So you know why I'm here, why I'm so connected to the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. I have experienced many um, examples of grief in my life, starting with my dad in 2005, who passed from idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So that tells you why I'm so close to this organization and it's dear to my heart. My 22-year-old son passed away in 2007. I've lost many um, friends and acquaintances and other relations. And then my mom most recently, two years ago, passed away. So I am a writer, I'm a speaker. And during all of these different episodes of grief and the journey that I've walked for grief, I've learned how to write about it in a journal to myself and share it with others and really process my feelings and thoughts. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I am going to ask you to think about writing in a different way. Now we've learned from a very early age how to write and take notes. So we write down other people's thoughts, other people's words, other people's feelings and observations by note writing. If a teacher is lecturing, in fact, today as I speak, I hope that you write down some notes that I say since we're not in person here today. And so we're used to doing that. We're used to note taking other people's words. Today, we're going to turn that around a little bit. And I'd like you to think about pulling your thoughts and feelings and emotions from the inside out. Because when we write down other people's words, we are writing down outside in. We are taking other people's words and bringing them to our inside space. So today we're going to take our words and pull them out. It's going to be um, emotional maybe. It might be messy because when we start thinking about what's inside and pulling that out, sometimes it gets messy and that's okay. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to think from the inside out and don't worry about critiquing your feelings, critiquing what you write down, anything like that. We're not going to worry about it. We're going to write from our heart. We're going to come up with new ideas. If you've been a writer or a journaler for years, I hope to give you new ideas about how to do that. If you have never picked up a pen and a piece of paper to write down your feelings, we're going to talk about that today. And I hope that um, 
by the time we're done, it, you will see the pattern of how what you write down during your grief path and how you process it can help you heal and help you heal others. And so that's what we're going to do today. One thing I want you to think about is being good enough. If you've never written before, I often hear, well, I'm scared to write down my feelings. I don't think I'm good enough. I'm not a good enough writer. Again, we're not going to talk about spelling or punctuation or um, structure of a sentence today. We're going to talk about writing down your feelings. And so they're your feelings. You're going to put them in a journal in a safe place. And that's what you need to think about. You're putting your words and your thoughts and your feelings in this place of safety. And you're all good enough. We are all good enough to do this. This is one of my favorite quotes that I talk about all the time, that um, being good enough and saying this to yourself, I am good enough, because no one is better or worse than another. We're all good enough. And I truly believe that. I'm going to start today um, with this process that I call the breath of green. This is a technique I have taught for over 20 years. It works for me. It's worked for hundreds of people. And so I like to go through this really quick so that it is something that you have in your toolbox to use when you start your grief writing and your journal, your journaling. I call it the breath of green because I like to think of green as fresh and clean. And if you think about um, alternative medicines, they have chakra energy systems. And the one around our heart is green. And that's why I call it the breath of green. It really is a one breath meditation that I hope you can use, um, not just in writing, but in all aspects of your life. So I'd like you right now with me to put one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly and take a big breath in. Now, most of the time, everything raises, but I'd like you to take one more and this time concentrate on filling your lungs, which are up here, really filling those lungs. And as you take the breath, visualize breathing in fresh, crisp, green air. And as you exhale, I want you to visualize pushing out all of your worries, all of your concerns, all of your hesitation about being able to write or writing in your journal or any other worries that you have in life. Now, the way you can implement this in your life is every time you see green, whether it's a tree outside or a piece of paper or a green light after you've been stopped at a red stoplight and it turns green, visualize breathing in green, breathing out fear. Breathe in love, breathe out fear because worries and concerns all come under the heading of fear. And I like to visualize filling up our lungs with love, green, fresh love. Now, again, you can use this many ways. If you're not like me, who really loves to talk in front of people and you have a presentation to do, it never fails that someone in the room will be wearing a green sweater or have a green pen. And so every time you see green, breathe in love and breathe out fear. It starts to be reticular thinking. The more you think about it, the more you search for green, the more you will see, the more your mind will want to search for green and you'll see it. So breathe in love, breathe out fear. This is something that you can do right before you start writing in your journal, especially grief writing. I started writing, as I said, I've had many friends pass and my best friend passed in 19... 95, excuse me. And I wrote a letter. I was in a um, creative writing class and our assignment was to write somebody a letter. There was no stipulation who or what the letter should be about. And so I decided to write my friend who had just recently passed away this letter. So today as we go through and I give you tips and techniques about writing, I'm also going to share some of my very personal grief writing that I have done on my own. And I'm just going to read them to you. So this first one, I'm going to read this letter, um, Dear Carlene, that I wrote after she passed in 1995. Dear Carlene, it has been nine months since the call came from Pam that you were gone. 
I still remember that morning, the smell of the air, the way I laughed when JT handed me the phone. He said, it's Pam. She says it's an emergency. I thought, what emergency? She probably won't be around next week when I plan to visit Spearfish. I remember taking the phone and saying, so what is this big emergency? After a minute or two of her saying something about bad news, she said, Carlene died last night. It didn't register with me. After all, hadn't I just talked to you two days earlier? Hadn't I cried and told you how emotional it was to see Jeremiah graduate from high school? Hadn't we made plans for me to visit the next week and stay at your house? Hadn't you planned to bring the girls and visit me in the summer? The rest of the phone conversation seemed like a fuzzy dream. I knew someone was talking to me, but I couldn't make words come out of my mouth. I heard something about dying in your sleep, maybe your heart. They wouldn't know until the autopsy. I remember hearing goodbye. Dropping the phone on the table, I slid down the wall I had been leaning against and puddled on the floor. I couldn't feel any sensation in my legs to hold me up. I remember Jeremiah crouching down beside me, asking me what was wrong. I felt like I had just been on the top of the highest roller coaster and in one second hurled to the bottom with my heart being ripped out somewhere in between. Emptiness turned over and over in my stomach until I had to run to the bathroom to throw up. I wanted to get rid of the feeling, the phone call, the reality. I wanted it out of me and to be smelling the spring air that I had just moments earlier enjoyed. For the rest of that day and weeks after, I walked through my life without being in it. It was like being two people. One was doing the normal things, driving, cooking, talking. The other was just watching. Watching as people touched me, talked to me, telling me how terrible it was. Watching things happen and feeling numb like I was in slow motion. Unable to participate or communicate in the world that was going on around me. Not understanding how the world could be going on around me. How could people be laughing, living, acting normal? I wanted to just scream at them. Don't you know she is dead? Then came the anger. Anger because this great God we are supposed to have would pick you to take away when there are so many hateful people in the world that he allows to stay. Anger because John and the girls are alone. Anger because you won't be calling to cry on my shoulder when Chelsea graduates. Anger because you aren't here to tell me PMS only lasts a week and things will look better in a few days. Anger because it took months of autopsies and tests before the experts were able to explain why you died. Anger at myself for not knowing. I should have felt something was going to happen and anger at you for leaving. Sadness and loneliness mixed together so at times I'm not sure which I'm feeling but it drains the energy from my soul. When I talk to John and the girls, I hear the sadness and loneliness that I feel in their voices. It has to be so much worse for them. It makes me sad to think of you buried cold and alone, although I know it's not really you there. I live in a state of endless confusion, endless questions. How can you just be one day here and the next day you're gone? How am I supposed to zap you from my life like using a delete key on the computer? You're entwined in my life like a grapevine that grows in circles, so I'm not sure where it starts or ends. Everywhere I go, everywhere I look, you're there. The letters that you sent weekly since I moved are bundled in a rubber band in my office. The snowman that you made two years ago sits guarding my front door. A CD you gave me plays on the stereo. Your name is on my resume under references and your voice is forever etched in my mind. I'm not angry at you anymore. Logically, I understand about the defect in your heart that caused it to stop beating. I know you didn't choose to die and leave all the people you love feeling this pain. They say time heals. I would say time changes the hurt. Now, nearly nine months later, I can make it through my days. I can feel myself breathe again, laugh again. And I try hard to remember you with smiles and not always tears. But the confusion, anger, sadness, and loneliness are still here. Sometimes separately, sometimes altogether. Maybe that's the definition of grief. 
the mixture of emotional suffering that sits forever in your heart, waiting to attack at the strangest time or places. The other day, as I talked to John, he mentioned how your death has changed people. The people that knew you are a little nicer to other people. Take a little more time to listen and share things. I know it has changed me. I spend my hours thinking about my life. I see things differently now. I think life is really about experiences and relationships. What you give to other people, not what you take. It doesn't matter what you have or how important you are. It only matters what you leave behind in the hearts of people, what you teach them and how that touches them. I wish I had realized all you were giving me while you were alive. I need to tell you how much you touched me, changed me and how much I love you. I miss you desperately. Now that's one example of a prompt of what you can write and you can use writing a letter to someone as your prompt. It can be if you've um, lost someone in your life that you write it to your friend or your family member or loved one like I did in that example. And I want you to remember while we do this workshop together today that grief can come in many different ways and reasons. It doesn't have to be because you've lost someone. It could be because you have lost a job. It could be that you have, um, you have an illness and your way of life is different. And so you grieve your old life. And so a letter to my old life, a letter to my new life, um, a letter to that job that you're giving up. So many different ways you can use that letter writing as a prompt when you're processing and managing your grief. And so I share that with you today. Um, it's been a long time since my friend has passed and I still um, feel that letter when I wrote it, um, when I read that. Now, if you do have a piece of paper and a pencil handy, again, I'm hoping that you're taking a few notes. We're going to talk about another exercise just to get you writing. And that is list making. Let's make a list. Now, we are all used to making lists. Every one of us has made a grocery list in our life. We have probably written a list of chores for our children. We've written to-do list for ourselves. We're, we are comfortable making lists. In fact, I have been, um, I'm kind of a recovering list maker. I've made a lot of lists in my life. And so um, this is not unusual for us. But now for grief writing, let's think about the ideas we can come up with to make a list. You could make a list of the things that your loved one lost. If it is a loved one that has passed away that you are um, thinking of when you make this journal entry, what kind of things did they like? Um, why are you grateful that they were in your life? Make a list of those things. Make a list of things that you did together. Make a list of um, what that person did in their life or make a list of what you have done in your life. What are your accomplishments that you're proud of? Just make a list. Um, make a list of why you miss that person. Make a list of why you miss your old life. Make a list of anything that you can think of. I give you these really simple, <clears throat> easy prompts because if you become a journaler that writes every day, sometimes you pick up your journal and you think, my mind is blank. I have absolutely nothing to write about. You can always make a list. And sometimes what we're talking about is journaling for grief and our path in grief, our journey through grief, and how we process that. So sometimes a list can turn into a different kind of writing. I will tell you when I journal, I don't look at it right away. <clears throat> I write really fast. I don't think about... Um, punctuation. I don't think about spelling words. I just write. And then I put it away. I may look at it the next day. I may look at it a month from now or months, six months from now. And then sometimes when I pick it up and look at it again, I realize I can write about this list I made, or I can rewrite my thoughts in a different way. And by doing that, you are processing, you are managing your grief, you are managing your feelings, and it can turn into something really wonderful. As I said, I'm going to share um, 
several of my writings with you today. Um, most of them are not as long as that first one. So this is a picture that I'm sharing with you here of my son, who I said he passed in 2007. And this was just months before he passed the picture, one of my favorite pictures of the two of us together. And I really do believe that love teaches us to celebrate and that we should celebrate those we love. So the reading I'm going to share with you now is called We Will Have a Party. And then I'm going to talk about this when I'm done. We will have a party. It is his 30th birthday. So we will have a party, a celebration of his creation day. 30 years ago, he arrived with a twinkle in his eye and an impish smile, and he taught me love. 28 years ago, he laid in an emergency room limp from a concussion, and he taught me fear. 25 years ago, he dressed in a cowboy hat, chaps, and boots as he watched the Three Amigos movie with invisible friends and a rocking horse. And he taught me joy and laughter. He taught me imagination, or was it reality? 21 years ago, he hit home runs over the fence and danced through the bases. And he taught me possibility and to dance with life. 15 years ago, he challenged life for the risk of adventure, and he taught me patience. 12 years ago, he sat on the edge of the ocean, and he taught me what being an artist really is. 10 years ago, he wrote me notes of love, and he taught me compassion. Nine years ago, guitar in hand, he serenaded me with a song about mom, and he taught me pride. Eight years ago, he opened his heart to receive his newborn daughter as she arrived with twinkly eyes and an impish smile. He opened his arms to share her with me and he taught me the continuation of love. Seven years ago, he traveled on a new adventure leaving his body behind and through the darkness of despair, he taught me grace and gratitude. And then, he gently held my hand and powerfully lifted me up. He began life with me in a new way and he taught me courage and strength. He began whispering to me through thoughts and feelings and he taught me to listen. He began appearing to me in nature, music and messages and he taught me awareness. He began visiting me in dreams and visions and he taught me faith. We will celebrate him, a celebration of his creation day. We will celebrate love and joy, laughter and imagination, possibility, patience and pride. We will celebrate with compassion, courage and strength, with awareness and faith. We will dance for him. We will dance with him. It's his 30th birthday, so we will have a party. Now, I wrote that several years ago because um, it has now been 14 years since my son passed. But I want you to notice that this writing came from a list. It came from me writing down a list of things that my son had taught me while he was here. And I took that list and revamped it into a writing that helped me process and um, celebrate his life. And so I want you to see how you can take such simple things as writing a list and help process and manage your grief feelings. And so anything that you make into a list, you can look at it and read it and think about it and maybe rewrite it in a different way so that um, not all of your emotions of grief have to stay in that sadness that we feel um, so immediately afterwards, but maybe turn them into memories, happy memories and celebrations of the people that you're thinking of when you process your grief. So we will have a party again, another um, special writing that I did that I share with you today. I'd like to give you another idea of a writing prompt to process grief and um, feelings and emotions. And that is using a favorite photo. Now here I share with you some of my favorite photos. 
And when we do this workshop in person, I have you bring one and we actually do exercises so you can share your writing about the photo. But I wanna share these photos with you today. That center one is my son. That was taken by a neighbor when he was out in the front yard and he snapped it in a Polaroid picture and handed it to me. And so I'm the only one that has that picture. It is very special to me because I am the only one that has that. And it's special because he was such a sweet little boy with that twinkly eyes and impish smile. And then we have pictures of my parents looking out over a pond. Now, when you write about a favorite photo, in fact, when you write um, about anything, but especially a photo, I want you to write about the colors. Now talk about the breath of green. Look at this picture. My parents are surrounded in green. So I can only imagine that they're breathing in love and pushing out fear with their exhale. But writing about that photo, I wonder what they're thinking. I wonder if they're looking out and thinking about what their future holds. I wonder if they're looking out and thinking about all the life that they had lived together. I don't know. But see, we can, we can imagine and and write details about these favorite photos and where it was located. And was that summer or spring? Or what did the air smell like in this photo? I have a couple other pictures. The one down below, my parents were visiting the place they were married and that was one of their anniversaries and that's a special picture. And then um, down in the very corner, I um, am a dog lover. And that is my Yoji, my little Shih Tzu that I had for 16 years. I will tell you that Yoji saved my life for many reasons. She was with me through some of these grief um, passages that I took and it really saved my life. I was so grateful to have her in my life. And um, she's been gone about six years now. But I so remember that picture of her sitting on my lap on my front porch. And I can remember what she looked like and how her bark sounded. And so writing about a favorite pet because pets can touch our hearts as deeply as people can. And so don't discount the grief that we go through when we lose um, our favorite pet. And then as many of you know, when you've lost someone, we go through their belongings. And sometimes you come up with a um, picture that you had never seen before. This picture in the top corner of my mom. You know, we think of our parents as always being our parents, always being old, <laughs> maybe, or the age that they are. But we don't often think about what were they like when they were young. Now, my mom was about 20 in this picture and looks pretty sassy and pretty hot <laughs> in that picture. And so it's one of my favorite pictures of her now and to write about what she was like before she was my mom. What kind of emotions and feelings did she have as a teenager? And so writing about these favorite photographs can become such a personal, heartwarming, um, fun exercise to do in your grief journey. The one down on the corner again is my dad and that's me sitting on the back of his scooter. My dad always loved motorcycles. So I grew up with motorcycles being part of my life. And I love this picture because it's probably the first um, picture of me being on a motorcycle. And I was maybe a year, maybe 18 months in that picture. And that's my brother with the helmet on. And so favorite photographs, um, no matter what they are, they could be a photograph of just a place or a thing. But writing about favorite photographs is a great exercise for you to help, help you process your um, grief and your feelings and your emotions. Now, I mentioned that sometimes when we lose someone, we go through their things and you can find photographs. But the next um, prompt I'm going to give you to write about grief is to write about a pre precious possession. We all have them and maybe they belong to us, but they become more precious when we have lost someone in our life and we're struggling with grief and we are given something that was theirs or we have something that was theirs. And many times this can be something small. It doesn't have to be big. Um, it can be a piece of jewelry. It can be a, their favorite book, or um, it can be so many things. I have um, a flannel shirt that was my dad's that I wear, and I have a hat that was his that I wear uh, almost always on his birthday. 
and I wear it a lot in the winter. So that is one of my most precious possessions of my dad is his hat. So it can be anything and it's, it's um, special to us in different ways. So when you write about a precious possession, again, I want you to write about how you got it, who it belonged to, how did they acquire it? How did they take care of it? What are you doing with it? And where do you keep it? And again, where, how does it feel? Is it metal? Is it cloth? How does it feel and colors and feelings that it brings up in you when you hold this possession? Again, I am going to share a very personal one. And you'll find that when you do grief writing to process your grief, it's always personal. It's always special. Um, it's always meaningful to you. So when I say I share these um, personal writings with you, it is personal to me. And um, everything I've read to you today is true and um, comes from my grief, my processing of grief. I'm going to write, um, read to you about a precious possession I have that is pretty large. Um, when my son passed in 2007, I kept his truck. And I still have his truck 14 years later. And I will tell you where this writing came from after I read it to you. But it is a writing about keeping his truck and this precious possession. It's called, I drive his truck. It sits in the garage. Everyone wonders why I keep it. The dust and dirt of the seasons covers it. I walk by it every day as the months and years come and go. Twice a year, I drive it. I slide in the seat. The smell of him is fading and the air freshener he tucked in the vent is beginning to crumble. I carefully back down the driveway. The gear shift is tight with age. The windows rattle and the water seeps in as I drive it through the car wash. The repair shop asks me why I want the oil changed when there's only been 50 miles driven since the last service. I don't tell them. When I drive, I feel his arms blend with mine as our hands in unison hold the steering wheel. I push in his Bob Dylan cassette and it crackles loudly through the speakers. Our hands drum to the beat and we are off. We drive together, he and I, through 22 years of memories, the good, the painful, the magical, and the tragic. We find ourselves in a place where here and there, now and then, doesn't matter. A place where love binds us back together. When I carried him, I wanted to experience and remember every moment of my pregnancy and unmedicated contraction during his arrival. It would be my last passage through this process. I relive these now. His first steps, his first words, and his first day of school blur into the yellow lines of the road we travel. We drive by the baseball field where his little league tournaments were and the skate park responsible for his first stitches. We stop at the gardens where the stone holds his name and the saying by Rumi. We pass the gas station where I bought his last tank of gas. The wind whistles as we drive through town by his apartment and onto the interstate where we drive past as our thoughts and pain escalate. I hear his fishing poles and baseball equipment rattle in the back. The speed is cleansing. Together we sing, we laugh, we shout, we cry. We say prayers of gratitude for his life our life together, his brother, his sister, family, friends, and his daughter. I hear the echo from so many years ago when the phone rang with a voice telling me he was gone. Carefully, I position it back in the garage. Bob Dylan stops. Time is put in park as I feel his beard brush against my cheek. And I love you, mom hums in my ears. I answer, I love you too, honey. I love you so. Another anniversary of that phone call comes to an end. 
His birthday will be here soon. Until then, it sits in the garage. Everyone wonders why I keep it. Now that writing is about a very precious possession that still sits in my garage, but it came from an interesting journal entry. Now, I always encourage you to write um, every emotion that you feel. And sometimes it's going to be anger, sometimes it's going to be happy memories, sometimes it's gonna be very sad memories, but this one really came from an angry journal entry that I had made because everybody kept asking me why I keep this truck. What are you gonna do with that truck? Are you gonna get rid of that truck? Are you gonna sell that truck? Why do you keep that old truck? And I really got kind of angry about it. And so I decided I'm gonna just write my anger down in my journal. And I wrote down how angry I was that all of these people were questioning me when I didn't think it was their business. I could keep the truck if I wanted to, but I just felt so much pressure by everyone's opinion about keeping this truck or not keeping this truck or what I was going to do with it. And I just wrote it down in my journal, line after line after line of things people were saying to me and my anger because of it. Again, I mentioned earlier, I don't read these journal entries right away. So I came back to it at a later date and really started reading it. And I realized I didn't know why I was keeping the truck. I didn't know if I could put it into words why I was keeping the truck. I just knew I was keeping it and I didn't feel it was their business. So when I started writing down how I feel when I drive his truck, and yes, I drive it every year on his birthday and on the day of his passing and many times in between, but on those two days, especially, and for a big part of the year, it sits in my garage and isn't driven. But when I started to realize how I felt when I drove it, that is why I keep it. So I wrote that piece. I shared that with many of the people that were questioning me about why I keep it, what I was going to do with it. And after they read it, they would say, I will never question you again, because then they understood. But it took me getting really angry, writing a really angry journal entry for me to process those feelings of grief and the association that I have with the loss of my son and keeping his truck and why. And so again, another way that you could process your feelings and emotions and your grief by writing things down, whether it's in anger, whether it's in joy, whether it's in happy memories, and then going back to read it and processing it and thinking about it later and um, helping you on your path on this journey of grief. And speaking of that, one thing that I have not mentioned is during our grief path, there's always humor. You know, anything that happens to us in life, we can see the humor in it. We can see the funny little episodes. In fact, sometimes humor bubbles up at inappropriate moments. Have you ever been in a spot where it's tense and it's sad or it's stressful? And all of a sudden you start giggling about the silliest thing or, um, you know, a whole group can belly laugh about something and you think, how can you be laughing because this is such a sad time, but you can always find humor and it is so important to find the humor in hidden places. And so an exercise I would give you in your grief writing, in your journal writing is to find the hidden humor and write about it. I'm going to um, share another one. I mentioned that my dad passed in 2005 from idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is a picture of him, Charlie Hunt. And I was one of his caretakers during his last months and watching him struggle. And there was a day that we had something so funny happen that I had to write about it. And when you write about humor, when you go through these moments of laughter and hidden human humor, it lightens up the moment, it lightens your heart, it lightens the situation. And so it is so important to find these hidden pieces of humor in um, such a sad, tragic time and to remember it long after. So when you write about it, um, you have a documentation of that moment of humor. I'm going to read this one to you 
again, it is about my dad. And it was um, just days really before he passed. But it was such a funny, wonderful memory for me. And I love sharing this. It's only oatmeal. I remember the clock. It looked like oak. It wasn't. It was supposed to be a reminder of the time, time to get up, time to eat, time to watch a favorite TV show, or time to go to bed. But for my dad, it was a countdown, a countdown of every hour, minute, and second that he continued to live. He would sit in his lazy boy, staring at the clock as it ticked away what life he had remaining. When you are dying, and you know you are dying, Big things seem small and small things seem big. He was grateful for a clean sheet on his chair and the way he felt after a shower, a small thing. But the process of standing, shuffling to the bathroom and maneuvering oxygen tubes around him as he sat on the shower stool seemed big. One day we were waiting for the doctor to arrive. A car ride to the doctor's office had become more than he could handle. For the doctor to stop on his way home to check on him was a small effort, but big for my dad. The clock ticked. My dad watched the clock. I watched my dad. My mom watched me. The doctor opened the door and brought the fresh air of the outside in with him, disrupting the stuffy, stagnant smell that stillness, fear, and illness creates. He also brought a smile, compassion, and hope. After listening to my dad's lungs and heart, checking his blood pressure and asking the routine questions, my dad said he had something he was worried about. With weak, shaking hands, my dad reached to unbutton his pajama top. The doctor helped him. Pointing to his chest, my dad located a crusty, scabby looking circle. Between the sound of the tube sucking oxygen, my dad explained that he didn't know what the sore was and it had just appeared quickly. He was concerned. The doctor reached for the nearby reading light, pulling it down over my dad's chest. My mom stood on one side of my dad's chair and I stood next to the doctor. All three of us leaned in to scrutinize the mysterious growth. What is it? A new complication brought on by this disease? Something more dangerous? We all held our breath. The doctor hmmed and said, this is interesting. It looks like, it looks like, then the doctor put his thumb and middle finger together and flicked the mysterious mass as if it were a bug. It flew across my dad's chest. It looks like oatmeal, the doctor said. For the first time in many weeks, laughter erupted. My mom clapped her hands together. I wiped tears away as I held my stomach to stop the ache that comes from deep belly laughs. The doctor let his laughter roar and the oxygen machine was spastically trying to keep up with the strain of my dad's sudden need for more as he struggled to laugh. It was just oatmeal, a small innocent dribble of oatmeal that my dad's breakfast that had crested to form a mysterious mass, a big mysterious mass. Sometimes big things seem small and small things seem big and it may just be oatmeal. Now that one came from, I didn't write that all down when I wrote it, but every day in my dad's last months, I would write down how he did, what um, new developments came up, how he was feeling, what we talked about. And that day was such a joy to be able to write down something funny that had happened, something that had made us all, including my dad, laugh. And it still has become such a memory for me and something that I share I shared with my brother and sister, and we always say it can, it's, it's just oatmeal when things seem like it's something really bad and it maybe isn't and we overreact. It could just be oatmeal. So I'm going to um, go on and talk about gratitude here. It doesn't matter what I'm speaking about. I always work gratitude into it because I am a total believer that gratitude saved my life during um, the time of my dad's illness and during the loss of him and my son and my mom, being grateful has helped me get through and walk the path and journey of grief in um, a very loving and kind way. Because I believe that every moment we have a choice, we can either choose 
the path of fear or the path of faith. And you heard me talk before about how fear comes out. Fear can come out in anger and confusion and depression and guilt and shame. And faith comes out as love. So remember, breathe in love, breathe out fear. You're breathing in gratitude and breathing out all those things that cause fear that and anger and other emotions. And so living in a space of gratitude. When we talked about making a list and you've heard about making a gratitude list of things that you're grateful for, and that's a wonderful thing to do. Sometimes you can get redundant and say the same three things every day if you're gonna write down three things of gratitude. One thing I encourage you to look for is magnificent moments. As a child, we saw magnificent moments every second of our life, but now as an adult, sometimes we miss them. And again, it doesn't have to be splashy fireworks. It can be seeing a butterfly or a dragonfly and feeling like maybe that's a message from your loved one. It can be seeing the sunrise in the morning or the sunset in the evening. Whatever you feel is a magnificent moment that makes you stop and look makes you stop and be grateful and write those down. Again, you can have a section in your journal of things, magnificent moments that you see every day. And I try to come up with one every day. When we talk about gratitude, I'm going to give you an example of a gift that you can do for yourself or for others. And it's actually a gift that I did um, for my husband. In 2014, several years ago, I decided that I was going to um, give my husband a gift. And this is the picture. This is the journal that you see here. I was going to write down every day a reason that I loved him. And so I'm a writer. I collect journals. So I went into my stack of journals and found this one. And it says, all things grow with love. It was perfect. Now, by the way, when I say get a journal that you like, that you feel good holding, these are the kind of journals I like. I like the spiral because it can lay flat or you can fold it back. I like lines in my journals, but find the kind of journal that feels good in your hand that you like. And the same with the writing pen, whatever you like to write with. So I started this on January 1st, and this is what I wrote. This book is my gift to you, my gift of love every day, this year, I will note what I love about you, one thing or many. I write them down to show you how I feel and love you every day. I love you so. So I wrote in this book every day for a year, and it takes dedication to do that for a year. And I didn't want to just write down, I love you because you took out the garbage. I started watching him like a spy. And I would find things like how he would walk by me and brush my cheek with the back of his hand when I was doing dishes. And that made me feel loved. So I wrote every day for a year. Now, it was hard. And there was one day that I really had to search my heart to find a reason that I love this man. But even on that day, and I wrote that, today was a hard day to come up with a reason, but I found something that I wrote that I loved him for. And so I gave it to him at the end of the year. And he was so thrilled with it. This has become a precious possession. And the first year he put it by his nightstand and every night when we would go to bed, he'd say, I'm going to read you a story. And he would read what I wrote the year before. And it would make me relive that moment why I loved him and it would make him feel loved. I share this with you because there's so many applications for this. You could write a book of love about the person that you're grieving for and every day write down why you love that person. Now, I've taught this in a lot of grief writing workshops, and it usually plays out that the beginning is very sad, and you write the sad memories, the ones that you are most recent in your mind. But by the time you do this for a year, by the time you get to the end of the book, you will be writing happy memories, and you will have a documentation of the reasons and memories about this person that you loved. What a gift. What a gift to give to someone like I did for my husband. I had someone do it for their senior in high school and tuck it in their suitcase when they went away to college so that when they got homesick, they could read why mom loved them or why dad loved them. So many applications to write a book of love. In fact, that not good enough feeling that sometimes we have, what if we wrote a book of love to ourselves and said, this is why I love me today. The book of love. I... Um, share that with you as a special gift, $3 journal, and it's a special gift. So where do we go from here? 
there will be two handouts made available for you. One is going to be suggested writing prompts. Again, more of these prompts about what you can write about. And the other one is going to be writing suggestions about how to find the perfect journal, how to find a perfect spot in your home where you can sit and feel cozy, how to create a ritual of, I get up in the morning, get my coffee, I read something positive, I write in my journal, I do a little meditation. Do whatever kind of ritual feels good to you, where to keep your journal so that it's safe and how to feel like you are holding a place of safety for your words and your thoughts and your emotions and your feelings. And so um, I know these two handouts will be made available to you. My biggest goal today was really to help you understand that anybody can write, that writing down your feelings and your emotions and your um, worries and concerns and your happy memories during your path of grief really helps you process and manage those feelings. And you can learn a lot from yourself by writing down your feelings, even if it's anger, you can process things and learn a lot about yourself and about the grief path that we all walk together. I am so thrilled that you've connected with me here today. I hope I've given you some tips and techniques you can use. You can always contact me and I will give you um, a place here at the end that you can connect with me on any different, um, many different paths of social media and my email address. And in the meantime, I thank you for being here. I wish you great joy in your journey and happy writing. Thank you so much to Penny for sharing all those uh, beautiful practices that we can try in our own lives. Thank you too to Penny for, for sharing examples from her own life. It, it really takes a lot to be able to share like that. So I really appreciate her giving that to us. I hope that everyone today was able to find something that they found helpful and maybe that you'll try at least one or two of these practices in your own life. Thank you so much for joining us for Summit today. We are looking forward to seeing you all again bright and early tomorrow. Goodbye.